Heavenly Father, it was your will from the very beginning to manifest your glory perfectly through the broken body and spilled blood of your Son. It did not come upon you after the fall. It was decreed before the foundations of the world that you would send your Son to do this great work in order to redeem sinners just like us. I ask, Lord, that you would be glorified this morning in helping each and every one of us to see all those places where we have sought a claim to you, made a sacrifice to you, placed an offering before you, other than Christ, thinking somehow this can make us right with you. Be gracious and reveal those cause us to cast them out entirely that we might see the substance of the body and blood of Christ. And with all the power of the Holy Spirit you give us, surrender our whole lives to Him. Not part, but in whole. We know this is what pleases you, We know that Christ pleased you when he ascended that cross. So I ask that you would be gracious with us, that we might be as he is. In Jesus' name, amen. When we started Hebrews, you didn't think to yourself it was going to be fun, did you? Hebrews is not a fun book. It's glorious, it's magnificent, it's convicting, but it wouldn't be, I would never define it as fun. It's hard. The truths that are revealed in the book of Hebrews are the difference between life and death. Not physical, but eternal. And so I'm thankful for Pastor Kurt's counsel that we listen well. You can go through your whole life and do this. You can read your Bible, you can go to church, and you can sing, and then you can come before him and hear him say on that day, I never knew you. The author of Hebrews is striving in the power of the Spirit to make sure that doesn't happen. And so we want to do the same today. We want to listen with all our might to what God has to say through a sinful man like me. If you've been with us up to this point in time, then you've heard the author exalt Christ to a place that right now is sufficient for us to say, you can stop preaching on it, we're going to surrender, and we're going to worship Christ. He's already revealed him as the royal son of God, the creator and sustainer of all that is seen and unseen. He has told us that he is the eternal king, he is the suffering servant, he is the final word of God, and he is the merciful and faithful high priest. And then we've spent the last several weeks now considering his priesthood. If you remember back in Hebrews chapter 3, the author said, consider this Jesus. Think deeply about him because he's the one who has the power to forgive sins and grant us entrance into that holy tabernacle where we want to be. He is this high priest we've seen. He has a better ministry than the Levitical priests. He has a better ministry. He mediates a better covenant. He has a better house to bring us into. Pastor Kurt taught last week he has a better blood to offer us. And so we arrive. We have one more next week to look at. But we have another thing to add to Jesus' resume as high priest. It's a long resume. He offers us a better sacrifice than all the sacrifices for the centuries offered by the Levitical priests. A better sacrifice for two compelling reasons. And here's the key that I want you to get. Number one, his sacrifice is able to cleanse us and we need that or we have no hope. And number two, and I think really this is what the author was trying to emphasize in these verses in chapter 10. It not only has the power to cleanse us, it has the power to equip us to live these lives of loving obedience too. You say, well, that's really the hard part. 
I mean, Christ cleanses me and he makes me whole and makes me ready for heaven. That's total surrender. But this other part is hard. True, but not impossible. So from the passage today, I want you to see two things that hopefully will bring clarity to the cleansing power and the equipping power. Number one, the shadow of the law. And number two, the substance of Christ. The shadow of the law and the substance of Christ. Again and again, the author has hammered this point home. And if you don't have it by now, something's wrong. He has said, there's no way that the law and the sacrificial system under the priesthood can cleanse you and make you whole. It doesn't work. In fact, we saw in Hebrews chapter 7, when we first started looking at the high priesthood of Jesus Christ, the author said, now if per- perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than the one after of Aaron? So there would have been no need. No need for Christ if the law worked. But the law, the bulls, the goats, the sheep, the offerings under the priesthood of Aaron were never ever intended to make a person clean. That wasn't their purpose. That was their perverted purpose, but not their purpose. Look at verse 2. It says, otherwise, would they not have ceased to have been offered? The answer, of course, is yes. Right? I mean, if it worked, then it works. And you don't have to go back year after year on the Day of Atonement and send the high priest into the holiest of holies and put his life in danger to offer yet another sacrifice for the sins of the people. It did not have the power to make a sinner clean. And so year after year after year, they would sacrifice. It's common sense. My sister-in-law years ago was diagnosed with breast cancer. She had surgery. She went through chemotherapy and radiation. By God's grace, she found herself cancer-free and has remained cancer-free today. Now, it would have been odd had she, after she was found cancer-free, to go back to the doctor and say, give me more surgery, give me more chemotherapy, give me more radiation. He just said, absolutely not. You're cancer-free. If the blood of the bulls and the goats had the power to make God's people sin-free, there would have been no need for their continual use. But the point wasn't cleansing. The point was to point us to the substance, to Christ. Look at verse 1. These laws, the shadow of the laws, a shadow of the good things to come. The word shadow in the Greek, it it literally means a looming presence. When I think of shadows, it has that, that dark sense to it. But that's not the meaning here. It also is used in Scripture to describe a spiritual reality. In this particular case, the shadows are a spiritual reality pointing us to something better than the law and the tabernacle and the bull and the goats. And so just because the law can't make us clean does not render it useless. I think one of the great dangers in evangelical Christianity in the West is we look at the law and we think of it in a, in a Roman sense, a Romans chapter eight sense, and we dismiss it. But it was never intended to make us holy. It was intended to the point as to the one who can make us holy. In which case, the law, we can say, like the psalmist and the sage, becomes beautiful to us. The shadows are bad for saving. But the shadows are excellent for revealing truth, and specifically the truth of the high priesthood of Jesus Christ. I think one of the most obvious things that a shadow reveals is that there's a substance. Right? You don't have the sh- a shadow of anything unless there's some substance that's casting the shadow. You can't have a shadow unless there's something making it. In fact, we're told in verse 1, that the shadows are casting something, it's telling us there's something more real, more tangible. The, the author uses true forms here. But the shadow also tells us that whatever is there is close, right? You don't see a shadow that's being cast in New York, but you will see a shadow cast in your own backyard. And so the shadow not only reveals there's something tangible, but it reveals there's something really close at hand, near you. You can probably think of a movie when the shadow was the first thing that you saw before the character was revealed who was casting it. And usually in the movies, it's this dark, ominous shadow, right? 
for those of you who are C.S. Lewis fans, if you remember, I don't know if it's in the movie, I can't remember, but I remember in the book, Prince Caspian, remember Peter and Susan and Edmund and Lucy, they go back to Narnia, and Lucy sees Aslan. She's the only one that sees him first, and the rest don't see him until Edmund sees his shadow. And Edmund says to Lucy, this is great, Edmund sees their old friend, the shadow only, and he says, I think it's Aslan. And Lucy says, no, it is Aslan. And then Edmund says, I do believe you're right, Lou. And then he began to reveal himself. The sacrificial law, although unable to save a single person, was fantastic as a shadow in pointing us to Christ. So we don't want to dismiss it as useless. We want to embrace it as beautiful in its intended purpose. The secondly, though, the sacrificial law was a shadow that pointed us to the substance, and in so doing, it revealed the sin remained, that judgment was still there unless something else happened. The shadow of the law leaves sinful man fully aware of his sin and that there is no bull or goat or sheep that can die and save a sinner. If the ceremonial law had the power to take away their sins, look at verse 2, the latter part. The worshipers, all those Jews who went to Jerusalem on the Day of Atonement, the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. Now, he's not talking about if, if, if the, the, the goat that was sacrificed in the holiest of holies worked, that they would become unconscious of sin. He's not talking about that. He's saying they would no longer be burdened by the consequences of sin. If the sacrifice in the Day of Atonement worked, they would no longer be dreading the fact that apart from a true Savior, they stand condemned before a holy God. That what awaits all sinners apart from Jesus Christ as high priest is death, judgment, and eternal condemnation. No Jew in his right mind left Jerusalem on the Day of Atonement and went home saying to themselves, sin is no longer a problem in my life. They didn't think like that. In fact, the shadow of the law, it had the opposite effect. Look at verse three with me. In these sacrifices, there is what? There's a reminder of sins every year. So every year, faithful worshipers would Go up the mountain, up to Jerusalem on that pilgrimage on the day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, the day when that high priest would enter the holiest of holies and sacrifice a goat on behalf of the sins of the people. And if it had truly granted forgiveness, if it worked and it purified the sins of the nation, then they would have left with a clear conscience. They would have gone home singing, and they did sing, but not because they thought they were sinless. They knew Every year they would go back because they knew their consciences testified that there was a greater sacrifice needed. That the bulls and the goats and the sheep and all the offerings and all the sacrifices were not sufficient to cleanse even a single sin, let alone a lifetime. So as they made their way down from the holy city back to their respective homes, they were painfully aware that something someone vastly superior would have to come and do a work if they had any hope of drawing near to God in love. They knew that. They knew that. It's the same for us, my beloved. Every shadowy Savior you have smuggled into your Christian faith, every sacrificial system that you have placed in the presence of the cross and saying, if I do this, if I love like this, if I pray like this, if I minister like this, then God will receive me. Everyone leaves you with a greater knowledge of it's not sufficient. I'm still stained. I'm still impure. I still need a Savior to pay for my sins and make me holy. In other words, whenever you engage in that act, you come to realize no sacrifice, no good work, no religious exercise that you do can free you from the debt of death and condemnation. I saw a news clip probably a month ago now of a young lady in our area who was bringing meals to those in need 
during the shelter in place. Wonderful act of communal love. At the end of the news clip, the newscaster asked her why she was doing it, and this is what she said, and it broke my heart. She said, it makes me feel good. It makes me feel good about myself. It justifies my life. It justifies my life. Now, in that moment, her conscience was probably wrongly clear, but when that service ended, she would go back and say, now what must I do? Because the conscience not cleared by the blood of Christ remains convicted, remains guilty. Our personal perfection programs, like the yearly sacrifices in Jerusalem, they do not clear our guilty consciences. What they tell us is that the sin remains, and we need a permanent Savior. We need a permanent cleansing. And so I'm thankful the shadow points us to that. Every time we go back to it, every time we say, well, this will work, this will help, I can add this to the cross, it does the exact opposite. No, I'm still guilty, I need Christ. And so I'm thankful for the shadow daily reminding me and hopefully you that we have no hope apart from Jesus. So the shadow of the law is good in that it points us to the substance. The shadow of the law is good in that it reminds us that we are sinners that need to be cleaned. And I'll give you one more before we get to the substance. The shadow of the law reminds us of the absolute impossibility of being saved apart from the blood of Christ. 100% impossible. Look at verse 3 again. In these sacrifices, referring to the sacrifices under the Old Covenant, in these sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. Verse 4, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Now that may seem obvious to you, but you weren't constantly doing that as part of your religion. The Jews were. So the author's making sure that they know that that can't be confusing in their faith. Now, we live in a culture, my beloved, where we, I dare say, now more than maybe our most recent past, we love to lie to one another. We lie about all kinds of things. We lie, and we don't even check those lies. We love to lie, especially to our youth. Young people generally are less educated. They're less critical, and so they don't ask the questions that the older person's going to ask. One lie that's been perpetuated now probably for two or three decades is that you can do anything if you set your mind to it. Have you heard that before? If you remain true to your heart, nothing will be impossible for you. Adidas went so far in their advertising campaign to come out with a doxology on this teaching. Listen to this. Adidas said, impossible is just a big word thrown around by small men who find it easier to live in the world they've been given than to explore the power they have to change it. Oh, listen with all your might. Adidas says, impossible is not a fact, it's an opinion. Impossible is not a declaration, it's a dare. Impossible is potential. Impossible is temporary. Impossible is nothing. According to this thinking and this definition, Jesus Christ must have been a very, very small man. Because when Jesus was asked by his disciples, who can be saved? Jesus said, Matthew 19, 26, with man, this salvation is impossible. But then he said, with God, all things are possible. In other words, apart from the saving grace of Jesus Christ, it is impossible for every man, woman, and child to be saved. I would say that is in contradiction to the definition given to us by Adidas. At the most extreme degree. Jesus said in John 3.16, Whoever believes in me shall not perish, but have eternal life. It is not only possible to be saved, it is guaranteed to be saved if you put your faith in Christ. And then he says one verse later, Actually, two, John 3, 18. Whoever does not believe, Jesus says, stands condemned already. In other words, any other faith in any other thing other than Jesus, his body, his blood, and it is impossible to be saved. This knowledge, I would argue, is invaluable. It's important to know, my beloved, what is possible and what is impossible if you want to live a wise life now and have eternal life in Christ. Most of you probably know years ago, I I coached high school football 
And I cannot think of a year that passed when I had at least one parent, usually more than one parent, would talk to me about their son playing in the NFL. It was one of those strange dialogues where you don't want to hurt feelings. You don't want to laugh. In all the years I coached, I had one player make it to Division I, and he dropped out his first year. Most high school football players have no chance of making the NFL. In fact, 0.08% of high school football players get drafted to the NFL. That's eight out of every 10,000 football players. You say, well, that's not impossible. It's not impossible. It's improbable. For some of my athletes, it was absolutely impossible. I say that in love. They tried really hard, but there was no way they were going beyond third string in a high school football team. That's football. According to our Lord, knowing what is possible and impossible is the difference between eternal life and eternal death. I mean, you get confused on a football field and it may shatter your dreams of playing professional football. You get confused here and you miss life, eternal life. Your efforts to make yourself right before God. Listen, no matter how elaborate they are, how sacrificial they are, how other-centered they may be, are equally impossible in saving your soul. No power there. Such good news. That's good news, my beloved, because the more you begin to understand that, the more you say, you know, there's nothing I can do in my whole life. Not one act of service, not one act of love, not one obligation of God's commands adhered to or submitted to that can have any ability to save me. What's that going to cause you to do? Those are all shadows. You're going to say, well, I need substance. I need someone that can. And you will, you will stop looking at these shadows and you will turn to the substance who is Christ, who has the power to make those perfect so we can draw near to God. You will turn to the substance who is Christ, who can give you the clear conscience because he can cleanse you of your sins. It's not a sleight of hand. It's truly a clear conscience that you will know on that day before God there will be no condemnation for you because you're in him. You will turn to the one who said, oh, by the way, I can take your sins away. You'll turn to him. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 9? Before healing the paralytic, remember what Jesus did? He forgave the man of his sins before he healed his physical ailments. Oh, this did not make some of his followers happy. Jesus said to the man, Matthew chapter 9, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. He's committing blasphemy. Now, why, why, did, they, why did they believe that? Because no one but God can forgive sin. So they were right in their theology. Their mistake was they didn't realize that Jesus Christ is God. And as God, he has the ability to take away our sins. You cannot afford to make the same mistake the scribes made on that day when they watched Jesus not only forgive this man of his sins, but then give me the ability to walk. You cannot make that same mistake, my friends. If we have any hope of entering into God's tabernacle and remaining with him, then we must know that the sins of sinners have to be, look at verse four, it says, taken away. The Old Testament says, as far as the east is from the west. The Old Testament says, so far that God does not remember our sins any longer. Only then will your conscience be cleared. Only then will you be able to say to yourself, I have no doubt that when I stand before God on that day of judgment, that I will not be condemned, not because of anything that I have done, but because of the perfect sacrifice of Christ on the cross. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to save a sinner. It is impossible for you to do anything to save yourself. But what is impossible for man is not impossible for God. And that's why God the Father, according to his will, sent the Son. Okay? So the substance is good. It cannot save you, but it tells us, it points us to Christ, it reminds us that we're sinners, and it reminds us that it's impossible for us to save ourselves. Are you still with me? All right, 
Second point, the substance of Christ. This is what you want to hear anyway, right? So let's get to Christ. Let's talk about the substance, not about the shadows. Look at verse 5. Consequently, so in light of everything we just said, the impossibility of the, of the law to purify a sinner, consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, quote, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. Verse 6, in burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Verse 7, then I said, Christ now speaking, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. So after establishing unequivocally the impossibility of a sacrifice of any kind made by man, of saving us, the author now turns from the shadow of the law to the substance of Christ. He says, we've talked enough about the law, now let's talk about the substance of this Savior. And he hones in on something he hasn't honed in on yet. He's talking about the physical body of Jesus Christ, his actual flesh. And he does that, remember, he's writing to a Jewish audience in the first century, likely in Rome, being persecuted. And so he goes to Psalm 40. It's a messianic Psalm of David. He said, let's talk about this Savior, this Son of God, taking on flesh, taking on a human body, and actually becoming a man. That he would come into this world in order to have his beautiful, perfect body destroyed. From this passage, I think we learn one of the wonderful and awful truths of the reasons, one of the reasons that Jesus came in the flesh. There are lots of reasons that Jesus became an in incarnate living as a man, but this one tells us that he became fully man in order to offer up his physical body. Remember the high priest on the day of atonement would take the physical body of the goat and sacrifice that goat on behalf of the sins of the people. So here, the Son of God, fully man, offering up his body, not a bull, not a goat, but his body, voluntarily in loving obedience to his Father. As a once, and hear the words you want to hear, forever sacrifice for you. Once and forever for the sins of man, and in so doing, what? Making the impossible possible. For us, by grace, reconciling man to God once and for all, by grace through faith. You see, my beloved, deep down, all the sacrifices, all the offerings for the centuries that God, God himself implemented in the law, it's not what he desired most for his people. It wasn't then and it isn't now. What God has always wanted most from his people is loving obedience. Children who love him and because of the love they've received from him, they want to obey. They want to serve. They want to sacrifice. They want to give of their lives. You remember what happened when King Saul missed this? He would have been, he had done well to hear the sermon from Hebrews. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, the prophet Samuel said to King Saul, after the king, remember he was commanded by God to devote to destruction the Amalekites. Everything. Per Yahweh's command. King Saul had a different idea. Samuel confronted him saying this, <clears throat> First Samuel 15, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much in obedience to his voice? And then Samuel said, behold, listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and attentiveness is better than the fat of rams. And then he says to Saul, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Samuel said, oh, God said, do this. You said, I'm not. I'm going to do something else. Lost the throne. King Saul tried to justify his actions. We're so good at this. <laughs> Listen to this, 1 Samuel 15, 21. He said, we took the sheep and the cattle from the plunder, the best of the things, and devoted, devoted to destruction in order to sacrifice them to the Lord. We saved him for God. God told us to destroy him, but we thought better. God would have none of King Saul's excuse. 
sacrifices instead of loving obedience. And it's true for us, my beloved. He will have none of that from you. I want you to listen closely. Lest you make the same mistake that King Saul made and think that somehow you can sacrifice and you can offer in, as a substitute of your simple obedience to God and that he'll be pleased by it. Our personal sacrifices and offerings, whatever they may be, that we engage in in place of our simple obedience to God's word. And we of all people today, having the book, having access to commentaries online, we of all people in human history have a higher accountability to this. It'll never, ever please the Lord if you put sacrifice and offering over simple obedience. So the sister in Christ, these are all true stories, The sister in Christ who worked at the soup kitchen on Sunday instead of gathering with the saints does not please the Lord. The doting daughter who sacrificially cared for her elderly parents but had no interest in discipling or being discipled does not please the Lord. The wealthy business owner who gives generously to the church but never shares the gospel with the lost is not pleasing to the Lord. You get the point. Obedience, God said, is better than sacrifice. Attentiveness to God is better than the fat of rams. Remember, the sacrifices he put in place, and he's saying, it's better to obey. If God, who appointed all these sacrifices and all the laws governing all the offerings in the Old Covenant, Each one served a particular purpose. They were put there by him, but ultimately they were there to point us to Christ, to point mankind to Christ. Not only to reveal, listen, not only to reveal that Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice and then we can stop trying. He did it for us, but the point that really hit me, and I so want us to get this as I close, is the type of sacrifice that Jesus made that Jesus gave his body to be broken for the sins of man. Now listen, by choice, not by duty, by desire, not by decree, by love, not by the law. Jesus' perfect obedience to the Father's will was literally the destruction of his body upon the cross to save sinners like us. The Father's will for the incarnate Son Revealed centuries before. I think Isaiah, of all the prophets, made it crystal clear. I want to read to you some portions from Isaiah 53. This was the Father's will for the Son. Jesus took up our pain and bore our suffering. We considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Please don't let the familiarity of these verses not have the right effect. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. The will of the Father for the Son, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He, Christ, was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Yet it was the Lord's will, listen, it was the Father's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And he has suffered. He will see the light of life afterwards and be satisfied. My righteous servant will justify many. It was God the Father's will that his perfect son his perfect son's precious body would be sacrificed on the cross so that sinners like us could be justified before God. Our physical body is that vehicle upon which the whole person rides, right? Your soul, your mind, your heart, your everything. So it was the Father's will, the Father's desire that Christ in the flesh give up everything on the cross including the relationship, the intimacy he enjoyed with the Father in order to be the once and forever 
perfect sacrifice for us. And this, my beloved, what's so amazing about this, this was not just the Father's desire, this was Jesus' desire too. Christ wanted to do this out of his love for God and his love for you. So Christ fulfilled the Father's will, prophesied in the Old Testament, offering himself up as a living sacrifice for many, not because the law mandated it. You know that, right? The prophecies pointed to the voluntary sacrifice of Christ. Christ was not mandated by the law or the old covenant to do any of this. Fully justified in saving no one. But he wanted to. Christ wanted to obey his father. He wanted to express his love for his father. He wanted to express his love for you by taking his body and ascending that cross and receiving the punishment we justly deserve. Look at verse 8. When he said above, he's referring to the, the quote from Psalm 40 above. You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices or offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Verse 9, then he, Christ, added, behold, I have come to do your will. So all the animal sacrifices and all the offering under the old covenant, that was according to the law. Christ said, I didn't come because the law told me to. I came freely. I came voluntarily to do my Father's will because I love the Father and I love sinful man. This is earth shattering, by the way. Not only because it, it gives you a glimpse into the Savior's heart, but I hope you will see it. It will equip you to live a life like Christ. By Jesus doing the Father's will freely, in loving obedience to God. Two incredible things happen in the passage. First, this extreme act of love of Christ taking up our pain, bearing our suffering, being pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, stricken by God. It put away the old covenant. It sealed it up. And it ushered in anew. Look at verse nine, latter part. He, Jesus, does away with the first, that's the old covenant, in order to establish the second, that's the new covenant. Through his selfless, sacrificial death, he put away the old covenant that had no power to save man, and he ushered in the power of the new covenant, sealing it by his own body, sealing it by his own blood, so that, listen, every single man, every single woman, every single child, regardless of past, present, age, race, gender, education, Anyone who repents of their sins and puts their faith in this high priest, God says, come in. You are forgiven. You are washed white as snow. Come into my presence. Dwell with me now. Dwell with me forever. This is the promise of the new covenant. That, that we, by trusting in the broken body and spilled blood of Christ, that we, our bodies, our whole lives, will be submitted to God, and that's how we will live. Not partially saved, fully brought in. Your life now becoming a living sacrifice unto the Lord, just like Jesus. Our Lord's voluntary sacrifice on the cross accomplished the Father's will, ushering in the new covenant and the possibility of sinful people like us being saved. But there's a second piece here. This extreme act of love displayed upon the cross, it not only saves you, it brings you in, it equips you to live right now. Now this is the most shocking part. To live right now in that same type of loving obedience. Not because you have to, but because you want to. Look at verse 10. And by that will, that's the will of the Father, sending the Son in body as a human person to die upon the cross, in that will, by that will, we have been sanctified, past tense, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So the work of Christ was complete. No more annual days of atonement. No need to go back to Jerusalem and sacrifice the goat. Once and for all, Christ, through his broken body and spilled blood, he sanctifies, sets apart people for himself. 
sinners. You and me. Right now, if Christ is yours, God looks upon you and he sees the perfection of Christ. And in the eyes of God right now, you are sinless. I, I, don't, I don't think I've ever said that in 20 years and it's just hard to kind of shake your head. That's a true statement. You have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Christ sacrificed himself. He died. He was buried. He rose. It is done. Holy people. Holy people. That's who you are. That's who you are in Christ. Mm. Therefore, we ought to live like holy people. Right, that's, that's not complicated. If we are holy, we should live like holy people, set apart. Look at verse 10 again. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Christ was sanctified. That word literally means to be set apart by God, to do a great work. God, set up, God the Father set apart Christ. He came in the body to do the Father's will, to ascend the cross, to die for sinners like us. Now you, if you're in Christ and you've been sanctified, you, your body, your heart, your mind, your soul has been set apart too. To do what? To serve the Father. To do His will for your life. Now His will for you is not to ascend the cross and die for the sins of many. Christ did that once and for all. But He does have a will for you. He has work for you. Work according to Ephesians 2.10 that was written before the foundations of the world. The great conclusion by the Apostle Paul after his, doctoral, uh, his, his thesis established in the first 12 chapters, what does he say in chapter 12? Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies, your whole life, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And then he says this, now listen, this is your true and proper worship. Oh, I wish we could get this. True and proper worship of the living God in Christ is not going through the motions. You know you can come here and do this and not worship God. You know that. Right? You can read your Bible and not worship God. You can pray and not worship God. You say, well, how is that possible? Reading our Bibles, praying daily. If we are not doing it out of our deep love for God because of the grace that he poured out in Christ, it's not true worship. The New Testament commands... They're shadows of Christianity. Do you know that? Gathering on the Lord's Day is a shadow of Christianity. True Christianity, the substance of Christianity that leads to true worship is your whole life, heart, mind, soul, and strength done out of your love for God. Your whole life. That's true worship. Living your whole life in loving service to the Lord. Why? Because you want to. You want to. Are there, new, are there commands under the new covenant in the New Testament? Yeah, over a thousand actually. I think a thousand fifty if you want to delineate them all out. But we don't do them because the law says to do them. We do them in Christ because we want to do them. In other words, your life becomes as Christ's life was. Look at verse five. You will say as Jesus did, verse five. Sacrifices, this is your prayer to the Lord. Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. Your body. Why are you here? Why didn't God save you and take you home? Your body still. Verse nine. Behold, I pray you can say, I have come to do your will. That should be our right response to this sermon. I've come to do your will. The substance of our faith must be grounded in the mercy of God shown to us in Christ. A mercy so powerful that it does in fact have the ability to transform your heart. So powerful that you can be utterly changed from the inside out. So changed, my beloved, that your duty that you're called and commanded to do in the New Testament will become your choice. So transformed that you will mortify sin. 
You will read your Bible and study your Bible and you'll pray in community and you'll use your gifts and you'll exercise your ministry all because you want to. And that's where the penny drops and the whole world becomes aligned and everything starts to make sense. Christianity is not about obeying these laws. Christianity is about a captivated heart. It's about a captured heart. A heart so captured by Christ that you say like Isaiah, in Isaiah 6 we saw last week, Lord send me, what shall I do? Tell me now, I'll go, I'll do whatever you want, every moment of every day. When the laws of God turn into acts of sacrificial love, that's true worship. When the laws of God turn into acts of sacrificial love, then you know you are engaged in true and proper worship. Is that what's happening right now? Was that your heart coming into this place? Not I gotta go to the church, it's the Lord's day, we're supposed to gather, Hebrews 10, 25, we'll get there. But, oh, I can't wait. It's the Lord's day. I can't wait to sing with my brothers and sisters. I can't wait to hear the word of God read. I can't wait to hear people pray. Someone said, well, why do you want to do that? So I want to. My heart's captured. So could it be, my beloved, that our struggles, obeying the simple commands of God, are because we still confuse duty and choice? Because we still don't see that much of what we do is a shadowy Christianity. It's just like the law under the old covenant. We do or we do not do because we think we have to rather than doing because we want to. Striving in our own power rather than living according to the Spirit of God. There are only three ways that you can respond to the righteous requirements that God sets forth in the New Testament. You know that. Three primary ways. First, you can know what you ought to do and willfully choose not to do it. Number two, you can know what to do and do it, but begrudgingly, clench teeth. And number three, you can know what you ought to do and do it joyfully because your heart's been captured by Christ. Not doing, doing it begrudgingly, or doing it filled with joy and love. The first, by the way, is very dangerous and may indicate that you don't have any idea who Christ is. You say, well, how can I make that statement? Because the Bible says so. 1 John 2, 4, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commands, the liar and the truth is not in him. That's bad. The second, I would argue, is equally dangerous. To be the older brother, in the, sorry, the prodigal son. To do the father's will, but hate every moment of it. John spoke to this also, 1 John 5, by this we, listen, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commands. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commands, and his commands are what? Not burdensome. So if you keep the commands because you have to, but they're burdensome, that may be a salvific issue, that may be a gospel issue. The last response, doing the commands of God joyfully, that's the gospel response. That's what... God has purposed from the beginning that his people will want to know him and love him and serve him in joy because of the relationship we have through Christ our King. That's always been the plan. In fact, 1 John 2, 5 says, whoever keeps his word, listen to this, in him truly the love of God is being perfected. So you obey the word of God because you want to obey the word of God? God says, hey, that's a great way to know that I'm perfecting my love in you. Be encouraged by that. Can I give you two examples and I'll close? I, I don't want you to hear this and go, yeah, yeah, I'm number three. Of course, of course, the gospel. I'll give you two examples, one well-known command and one not so well-known, and just evaluate yourself. The first is the Great Commission. I mean, we all, we all know the Great Commission. The parting words of Christ to the church. 
It's called the Great Commission because if the church does not engage in the making of disciples, go there, therefore and make disciples of all nations, well, we can hardly say that we're doing the work of the church. Simple enough, right? If you're going to make disciples, you're going to share the gospel with the lost. It's got to start there. If you're going to make disciples, you're going to sit down with people in the church, outside the church. You're going to study the Bible. You're going to pray together. You're going to grow each other in the faith. You're going to mature one another in the faith. Now listen. At this very moment, you, professing Christian, are in one of those three categories. At this very moment, you are either approaching this command faithfully or unfaithfully. If you hear the Great Commission, go make disciples. And you know that's what you ought to do, but at this moment you say, you know what? I'm not, and I'm okay with that. My circumstances in life are such where I'm justified by other things. There are other sacrifices and other offerings that I'm making that I don't have time to make disciples. Life, work, family, entertainment, they're in the way right now. That's dangerous. That's like King Saul. You say, well, I'm not there. I'm in a discipleship relationship, and I can't stand it, Pastor. I don't like it. I don't like spending the time with the person. I don't like studying the Bible. I don't like praying together. But I got to do it because a sermon's just like this. You tell me I got to do it, so I got to do it. Well, that's dangerous, too. The last category is where you want to be. Faithfully engaged in a discipleship relationship. You making a disciple, you being discipled. Why? Because you want to. You want to. So I, I want someone to breathe the gospel into me. I want someone to feed me, and I want to feed them back. And then I'm going to go find more people, and I'm going to do it again. And I'm going to train up people to go do it too, because that glorifies God. You're on the phone, you're emailing, emails, coffee, dinner, less disciple, less disciple. That's the gospel response. Where are you? Where are you right now? I'll give you one a little more obscure from the New Testament. I mean, there are over a thousand commands, so we can pick, got lots of time, right? Romans 12, 11, Paul calls upon Christians in Rome, do not be slothful in zeal, but fervent in spirit, this is a command, it's an imperative, fervent in spirit serving the Lord. Now that's straightforward too. Fervency in the Greek, the word literally means to boil or to make hot. So let me ask you, are you burning hot in your service to Christ? I mean burning hot. That's a command. Again, it's a straightforward command. We can either ignore it and say, you know what, that's not my personality. It's not about personality. It's about a captured heart. You say, no, you know, I'm striving, but I hate it. I'm trying to be burning hot. That's the pharisaical approach. The last one is we derive the strength and fortitude out of the love that God has poured out in our hearts in Christ, and we become fervent. We are compelled in the greatest way by God's love to be on fire for Christ. In your whole life, your whole life, compelled to give your body, your heart, your mind, your soul, your everything to serve Christ fervently. Where are you in that one? Ask yourself, if on these two that I gave you or the numerous ones you could think of yourself, you find yourself in category one or category two, the first thing to do is repent. Repent. Lord, forgive me for not making disciples. Forgive me for making disciples begrudgingly. Give me that heart's desire that I might be captured by Christ and make disciples in love. You say, no, I'm, I'm like Laodicea. I'm lukewarm. There's nothing hot about my life in Christ right now. Seek forgiveness. Repent and turn to Christ. He'll set you on fire. Oh, my goodness. You ask God... Make my life a burning, brilliant, whole life to you? He'll say yes, he wants that too. Jesus Christ, our merciful and high priest, gave his body as a living sacrifice to fulfill the law that we could not. And in so doing, grant you freely by grace through faith, love and salvation in his kingdom. And he did it voluntarily to show you that there's a better way. 
And it's not the law. It's love. There's a better way to obey. It's not duty. It's choice. It's not decree. It's desire. Get your heart captured by Christ. And this will become easy for you. You'll read the law and you'll say, oh, I can't wait to do that. Not because you have to in order to earn your salvation, but because you've been saved in Christ and now that's what you want to do. Giving your whole life just as he did. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we've gathered here this morning with our bodies, our physical bodies, our hearts, our minds, our souls, the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And we confess to you, Father, as a people that oftentimes we see these commands being burdensome and therefore we do not do them or we do them begrudgingly. Father, I ask that you would be gracious with me and my brothers and sisters and that you would change that permanently by showing us the great love that you have for us in Christ. That you would capture our hearts so completely and so fully that when we open up your word, we're saying, Lord, send me. I want to serve. I want to love. I want to be that burning flame for Christ. I want to be that testimony to this world that so desperately needs to see a Savior high priest like Jesus. Father, I ask that you would take this word and by your spirit and plant it deep in our hearts. We don't want a flash in the pants. We don't want an emotional response. We want truth to guide and change and that you would do that by your spirit. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would be gracious in that way. We cannot even approach this in the flesh, but by your grace and mercy, you can equip us to be just like Christ where we will stand before the Father and we will say, this body you have given to me that we might do your will, and then we would do it. We would walk in faith and not by sight. We would walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh. Father, we ask that thy will be done because we know that this is it. So do this great work in us, not only to bless us, but for your glory. In Christ's name, amen.